First, I would like to thank the organizers and in particular, of course, Professor Foy for uh, inviting me to this workshop. I must say it's an immense pleasure to be here. It's also a little bit frightening to be the person who is supposed to start this uh, uh, workshop. Uh, and uh, I would like to tell you a little bit uh, about some work that we did on clean and dirty bosons in uh, Wendy Lattice. I think I will, I will move this a little bit more up. Uh, okay. If you want to know more on other works that we are doing on the, in the group, I, re, I direct you to the, to the website of the group. And these are, of course, the sponsors that allowed us to uh, eat during the course of these uh, various researches. Uh, here are the people who did, uh, who did the, the, the work. Otherwise, I will take the mic if it doesn't. Uh, stick. So here are the people who worked on the two parts that I will tell you on Wendy clean bosons. Uh, we I had a very nice collaboration with Laurent Sanchez Palencia uh, at the uh, Polytechnique, and uh, we were very fortunate to work with experimentalists in cold atoms, Giovanni Modugno and uh, Massimo Inguccio. And uh, I had also very nice formal collaboration with Miguel Casalila and Andrew Ho. On the disorder, I have to mention my former advisor, uh, Ayn Schulz, who was, uh, unfortunately is, was gone too soon. And more recent work that I will do was done in collaboration with Guillaume Roux and Thomas Bartel, and again with the experimental group of uh, Giovanni Modugno and Massimo Inguccio. Okay, so let me start uh, on the uh, physics per se, but before, I don't think it's important to do historical reminder and so on. I'm sure the second part of the morning will, uh, will uh, uh, give you this, but I must say something, which is that when I started my PhD in 1984, which is already some time ago, uh, my advisor gave me a pile of paper to read, and among these papers were two papers which I think completely defined uh, my scientific career. So one is here. Uh, this is the paper by Mike Kostelitz on the renormalization of the XY model. And also the pleasure, uh, we had also the pleasure to have Mike for a sabbatical year in Orsay during my PhD. So I must say it was a very, very enjoyable uh, uh, experience for me. Uh, and the second paper is a paper by Duncan Aldane on uh, Lattinger liquid, which is the paper where he essentially defines what are Lattinger liquid. Uh, these are the papers on which I sweated as a young PhD student. So now you see which part of responsibility you have in shaping my, my career. Of course, you no responsibility for the bad parts, but only responsibilities for the good parts. So I, I just wanted to tell that because it's really uh, it was really an uh, important moment for me uh, during the course of my PhD. Okay, so let me uh, move uh, on the BKT transition, and again, I'll just uh, give you a, a very uh, brief account of the points I want to mention in connection with my talk. You will hear much more, I'm sure, directly by Mike Kostelitz. The important point is that it's a remarkable transition which is completely outside the paradigm of Landau phase transition, where you need a local order parameter, uh, this is a transition without an order parameter where you get something uh, at the end, the average of the magnetization or whatever is zero on both phases. And this is something which is defined by topological vortex excitations. Uh, here is a sort of standard image of vortices in an XY model, vortex and anti-vortex. And that was that type of transition sort of defined the whole world of a new class uh, of phase transition. Now, the question is where to look for BKT. And indeed, it was initially invented for the classical two-dimensional uh, system, uh, the XY model. But I think it's fair to say that if it only applied to the XY model, it probably would not have been very successful. But fortunately, this class of transition transcends the initial model for which it was built, and it applies to a lot of problems. So in particular, two-dimensional quantum problems, superfluid films, superconducting films. In particular, there were the beautiful experiments by John Reppy uh, testing for the universal jump of costelitz Staules. Uh, but here, the problem, if you try to test it on two-dimensional systems, is that actually these systems are not two-dimensional, but they are three-dimensional because of the time. So you need a finite temperature, you need dissipation to get rid of the time and go back to get the BKT transition. And it's, of course, perfectly possible. 
So another route, which is the route that I will uh, show you during this talk, is instead of fighting the time, just use the time, knock down one spatial dimension, go to 1D quantum problems, and essentially search for the BKT transition in 1 plus 1 quantum problems. And that's another big class of problems for which, of course, uh, BKT was really a, a cornerstone of the physics that, that occurred. Uh, note that in that case, of course, the temperature is the enemy because you don't want to knock down the last dimension. And therefore, you have to work as low uh, as you can. Uh, you have to work really uh, on a system which is as quantum uh, as you can. So <coughs> one class of problems in which one can search for BKT transition are 1D quantum fluids. And there, there is another paper of Duncan which was uh, absolutely crucial in uh, uh, helping in this direction, which is his famous PRL of uh, 1981, where he shows that the technique which is known as bosonization can not only be applied to fermions, as it was uh, done, uh, let's say, in the past, in the 70s, by in particular uh, Luther and Emery, but it's actually an extremely generic technique that works with any type of systems, uh, and in particular can be also used for uh, bosons. Uh, and in this paper, uh, Duncan, in a little paragraph in the middle of the uh, PRL, uh, discusses exactly what would happen if you take 1D bosons in a periodic uh, potential. I don't want to go in details, but I, I just quote here the passage of the paper where he says that with this expression for the density that I will show you in a moment, you can add a periodic substrate, which gives you this type of uh, potential, and then you can study it. And lo and behold, uh, you find a sine gordon theory. I will explain what it is. And then you have a phase transition, which is the phase transition that, occur that occurs for the sine gordon equation. And uh, essentially, you have a phase where the periodic potential is relevant and a phase where the periodic potential is irrelevant, which now we would call simply the mod transition of 1D boson. So it's hidden in the middle of this paper, but it's, it's definitely there. And it tells you that it, this transition will occur at a universal value of the parameters. OK, so let me try to elaborate a little bit on that and explain to you in more details how one can study the mod transition of bosons, 1D interacting quantum bosons in a periodic system. So the first thing is to express the density uh, of particles in a weird way, which I will not try to justify here, uh, which is expressed in terms of collective coordinates, uh, which I call phi here. And if you eliminate this oscillating factor, PR integers, you can view this as a kind of elastic uh, description. You can think of these phi's as kind of displacement compared to the perfect alignment of uh, bosons in a crystalline phase. Uh, this would be the hydrodynamic expression for the density. But actually, you go beyond this hydrodynamic by including this oscillating term. So you do a kind of Fourier decomposition of the density in terms which are around q equals 0, 2 pi uh, rho 0, where rho 0 is the average density, 4 pi rho 0, and so on and so forth. This is a very, very useful uh, expression, which actually can also be used for classical uh, n-dimensional systems. But I won't, discuss, uh, I, I won't discuss this point. Of course, uh, the single particle creation operator is the square root of the density times the exponential of a phase. So it defines a second collective coordinate. One is phi associated with the density. Another is theta associated with the superfluidity of the system. And because the, systems is, the system is quantum, these two phases are actually kind of canonically conjugate. So the gradient of phi is canonically conjugate to theta and vice versa by integration by part, which tells you that if there is a degree of quantum fluctuations in a system, you cannot, if you define perfectly the phase, you get large number fluctuations. And if you define perfectly the density at one point, you get large phase fluctuations. So this is a very nice representation from that point of view. And what is even nicer is that you can show that you can write the Hamiltonian of interacting, and I insist on interacting one-dimensional bosons, as a kind of sum of harmonic oscillators. 
So this pi pi is actually the gradient of the phase theta here. And uh, the Hamiltonian takes this form, where all the interactions and physical parameters are hidden in two parameters. One is the velocity of excitation here. And the other is a dimensionless parameter, which I call k, which incorporates the uh, interaction effects and will define completely the correlation functions of the problem. So it sounds like a miracle because you start from an interacting one-dimensional system of bosons, and at the end of the day, you get essentially a free Hamiltonian of harmonic oscillators, which corresponds to the sound waves, uh, essentially, of the density of bosons. And all the interactions define these two parameters, u and k. For example, for 1D bosons with the so-called Lieb-Linear model, which is a contact interaction, k is equal to infinity if the bosons are free, and k will tend to 1 if the bosons are infinitely repulsive. And we know how to go from the microscopic interaction to these uh, uh, parameters. Now, why is it uh, so important? Well, it is important because now if you add a periodic lattice on, again, one-dimensional interacting particles, you see that depending on the periodicity of the lattice, you can very easily rewrite the Hamiltonian, uh, the term which is periodic, by using this periodic expression that I showed before of the density. And then something will happen when this wave vector q, which is the period of the lattice, can or cannot be commensurate with the oscillations that you have in the density. So for example, if you're not commensurate, then you're left with a term like this, where delta is the difference between q and 2 pi rho 0. But these terms oscillate, so you can wipe out the cosine, and you're back to the pure quadratic Hamiltonian. So essentially, whether you put a lattice or you don't put a lattice doesn't make much of a difference. Actually, it does, but I don't want to discuss this uh, point here. I'll come back to it in a second. But if you're commensurate, so if q is equal to pi rho 0, which means you have exactly one boson per site, then essentially you add to your quadratic Hamiltonian a cosine term, and you go to the so-called sine Gordon Hamiltonian, which is so important, which has been so important in high energy uh, physics in particular. And then you see that there will be a competition between the fluctuations of the quadratic Hamiltonian and the uh, cosine term, which want to lock phi into a very particular value. Remember that if phi becomes locked to a number, then the density becomes a classical field. It means that the particles are fixed at precise positions in the system. So this uh, sine Gordon Hamiltonian will describe uh, the competition between the quantum fluctuations here. I rewrote the part of the Hamiltonian, which is uh, quadratic as uh, the action, so in space and uh, time, imaginary time, where the momentum is the time derivative of the field phi. So this part wants to fluctuate, wants to make the boson go a little bit everywhere, and this part wants to lock the bosons into particular position. You can view this thing as a periodic potential in phi, which will try to make the space-time trajectories of the particle, this is space, this is supposed to be time, uh, space-time trajectory of the particle stay around the minima of the uh, potential, uh, which is the cosine. And the quadratic term is like an elastic term that would like this line to meander everywhere in the system. As a result, if the cosine wins, the bosons stay in the minima. Uh, if the cosine loses, uh, the cosine is wiped out of the Hamiltonian, then essentially the lines go everywhere and you recover power law decay of correlation function. So this system is exactly mappable, and this was done in the 70s by Chui and Li in particular, is exactly mappable onto the BKT uh, renormalization equations that Mike Kostelitz uh, established. You can map this problem onto a Coulomb gas problem, and it has a BKT transition. And actually, in this language, the BKT transition occurs exactly when this parameter is equal to 2. You see that formally this part can be viewed as a two-dimensional problem in space and time. And this parameter k, if it was an Hamiltonian of a classical system, 
would be essentially the temperature. So it play here the quantum fluctuations, which are played by this parameter k, plays the role of a temperature in a classical two-dimensional problem. So this 1D quantum problem in space-time with its quantum fluctuation as a BKT transition at k equal 2. In addition, if you order phi, as I will discuss in a second, it has also a string order parameter, so a non-trivial uh, order parameter, which denotes, again, the topological nature uh, of, the, of the problem. Now, uh, this is, uh, in a way, the way to view the thing as an action. But if you are more quantum mechanically oriented, you can really realize that the cosine is a vortex operator. And for that, let me remind you, if I have in quantum mechanics a configuration x, and I apply the exponential of the momentum conjugate to x, it's the translation operator. So I shift x by the quantity a, which here in the exponential. If now I remember that phi is uh, the conjugate variable, is the great, uh, grad phi is the conjugate variable to theta, to the superfluid phase, I can rewrite phi as the integral from minus infinity to a given point of the momentum conjugate to the superfluid phase theta. And now you immediately see that if I apply a cosine to phi in space time, what I will do to the superfluid phase is to translate it by the quantity which is in the exponential, which will be 2 pi. And I will do this from minus infinity to the point at which the operator is applied, which means that I will make a shift of the superfluid phase by 2 pi on this cut here when I apply the, the operator cosine to phi. And if I unwind the phase, I will get exactly a vortex where the phase turns by 2 pi when I go around the, the vortex. So the operator cosine 2 phi is the vortex operator which creates vortices in the phase theta, which is the superfluid phase. So here would be the action rewritten in terms of the superfluid phase theta and its vortex operator phi. So this shows again the mapping between this and the BKT transition. OK. And of course, the coefficient of this uh, object will give you the vortex fugacity. So one can write out of this a generic uh, phase diagram for mod transitions. Uh, it, let me concentrate only on the case where there would be one particle per site. At the, uh, and this is as a function of the repulsion between the bosons. At the tip of the lobe here, there would be the transition at constant density. So here along this line, I would move with one boson per site. I get a transition with a universal parameter k equal 2. And if I am not at commensurate filling, so if I am somewhere here in the mod phase, but if I change the density of bosons, I, or the chemical potential, I will move uh, via another type of transition, which is called the commensurate, incommensurate transition, or the pokrovsky Talapov transition. And in that case, the uh, universality class is uh, different, and the universal value of the Luttinger parameter is also different. Uh, in that case. You have also mod transition for uh, fractional filling, but I will not discuss uh, this one. If you want to know more, here are a couple of references where you can find much more detail on this. These uh, predictions were tested uh, by DMRG. For example, here is a calculation by Till Kuhner and Steve White. It's very difficult to see, and just to confuse the reader, their definition of k is 1 over k in my language. So the value at the tip is not 2, but is 1 half. Uh, but it's the same value, and it, con it, it confirms uh, the, 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 the predictions. OK. Can we test it experimentally? And there, one very nice system to test this experimentally is provided by cold atomic gases. So just as a flash reminder of cold atomic gases, uh, you all are aware that one can trap and cool atoms using lasers. Here is an image. I think it's sodium atoms which are trapped uh, without touching any walls uh, uh, because uh, the walls are hot. So if you want to cool them, uh, you need them to not touch uh, any walls. Uh, here is what can be achieved. We are in the room where gases have a speed of 300 meters per second, essentially. And if you use various techniques of cooling, you can cool down to nanokelvins, rather 
10 of nano Kelvin, so this is pretty cold, let's say it that way, uh, where the speed of gases is less than one centimeter per second. And when you have this, of course, you can probe for quantum effects uh, in this regime, Bose-Einstein condensation, and so on and so forth. And there were two a very beautiful series of Nobel Prizes for these discoveries. Uh, the first one for the cooling mechanisms per se, and the second for the observation of the Bose-Einstein condensation in these uh, systems. Now, uh, Bose-Einstein condensation was observed here and studied in the limit of extremely weakly interacting bosons. But very soon, people realized that actually using these bosons, you can do virtual solids which are extremely nice because using two lasers, you can do a standing wave, and then the atom would be trapped in the minima of the standing wave, and they would tunnel from one minimum to the next. So it's like the periodic potential created by the ions in a solid. Except here, you can control the height of the potential, which means you can tune at will the hopping elements between the various sides of your system. It's something you tune in the lab. In addition, uh, if the atoms are neutral, so they only see each other when they are essentially in the same potential well. Uh, the force, uh, the uh, potential between two atoms separated by two potential well is essentially negligible. And moreover, when they are in the two potential well, you can use a trick which is called Feshbar resonance where you put a magnetic field on the top of the system, and this magnetic field shifts the levels of the atoms in such a way that you can make the scattering potential between them resonant. So you can get essentially the interaction going from minus infinity to plus infinity by again turning a knob in the lab, which means that you can control the interaction, short-range interaction, in the system. Now, this proposal was made by Peter Zoller in the end of the 90s and was spectacularly uh, tested uh, by the Munich group, uh, Marcus Greiner, Tilman Esslinger, Ted Ench, and Emmanuel Bloch, by observing the MOT transition of three-dimensional bosons, uh, so going from superfluid to MOT insulators. So this opened the whole field to use this cold atom as what people call quantum simulators of actual uh, solids uh, and test various phase transitions that could occur there. The nice thing is that you have a very good control of the model. You can control the lattice, the interactions. Uh, here is an image of the momentum distribution, which has a peak at k equals 0. The system is in a superfluid state. And if you change the lattice, you bring it to a mod state, so there is no peak in the momentum distribution. You can control the statistics by changing the atoms. Here is the momentum distribution of bosons uh, uh, with the peak which signal the Bose-Einstein condensation. Uh, this is the same momentum distribution. Whoops, what happened here? Uh, this is the same momentum distribution uh, uh, for fermions. So for example, lithium-6 is fermions, lithium-7 is bosons. So here you see the Fermi surface of uh, particles in a square lattice, which is, of course, a square, but which, to the best of my knowledge, there is no solid which has a, a, a cubic, uh, perfect cubic uh, arrangement. So uh, this can be in textbook when we teach uh, tight binding to uh, our students to show that, indeed, if you have a cubic lattice, you get a cubic Fermi surface. And, of course, you can control the dimensionality because if you make lattice by lasers, you can, for example, here make the barrier between this direction very high, the barrier in this direction very high, and then you will get one-dimensional tubes. Or you can just put a single barrier here, and then there will be high barrier between these pancakes, so you will realize two-dimensional pancakes. So by uh, this system, you can tune a little bit the dimensionality, the interaction, the hopping, and that provides a lot of interesting uh, uh, applications. In practice, it looks like this. Uh, uh, so uh, it's more complicated. And again, if you want to have more references uh, on uh, this type of topic, uh, here uh, 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 are the references. OK. So what do we do if we want to study the mod transition with 1D bosons? And this is an experiment that was done by Hans Christoph Nagel in Innsbruck, where he took 1D bosons, put an extremely weak lattice on the top of it, and 
then started to see if the system became an insulator. Here is the repulsion between the bosons. Uh, it's increasing in this direction. And here is the lattice height. Now, if you remember the costelli stauless transition or the sine gordon transition, there is a point. So this parameter gamma, which is a repulsion, can be transformed into the parameter k that I was mentioning. So here, the system should be superfluid if the lattice is weak. And then there should be a universal value for infinitesimal lattice, below which any lattice, even as small as you want, will turn the system into a MOT insulator. And of course, if you increase the lattice, if you change the fugacity of vortices, this point of transition is shifted. So here you could see the experiment. Uh, don't ask me how it tests that there is a MOT insulator or superfluid. I can explain that, but I don't think it's important for the moment. Uh, you see that essentially the, the points of the experiment with rather large error bars uh, tended to point out that there is indeed a value here for which uh, even an infinitesimal lattice would turn the system into a MOT insulator. More recently, in the group of Giovanni Modugno, uh, the same experiment, or the same type of experiment, I should say, was repeated. And we worked on it on the theoretical side uh, with Laurent Sanchez Palencia to bring both analytic uh, numerical quantum Monte Carlo uh, studies on the top of this. And you see that here, OK, first, the error bars on the experiments are much, much smaller. And uh, the quantum Monte Carlo and the analytics agree very well to tell you that there will be indeed a critical value, a magic value here of the interactions below which any lattice, as small as you want, will turn the system into uh, uh, an insulator. Of course, this point is what you get from the renormalized sine gordon theory. And uh, lo and behold, when you convert this value of the interaction into the Luttinger liquid parameter, you find that this is indeed k equal to. So this is a test of the universal value of the transition, of the BKT transition. Anywhere you start on this line, you will renormalize to this point and end up with this uh, k equal to uh, phase transition. OK. Uh, in addition. Uh, these systems have a non-local topological order. Uh, remember that the density is the gradient of this phase phi. So in a way, it means that if phi is ordered, I can take any exponential of phi, for example, this one, uh, and phi will be the integral of the density. So I will sum over uh, many sites. And I will do the exponential of i pi times the sum of the density, or the product of the exponential. And I can take any factor here, actually. This object will be ordered. Now you will say, oh, well, but this is a rather useless order parameter, because normally we have only local probes, and we can only probe the density at one point. Any point, but in one shot, we can only probe it at one point. Again, cold atoms were very nice from that point of view. Because actually using what they call a boson and now fermion microscope, they can get a snapshot of the density of the system in one measurement at any point of the system. So here is, for example, one image where they know that the density is 0 here, 1 here, 1 here, 1 here, 0 here, 0 here, 1 here, 1 here. So actually, you can compute this object by simply taking one image doing the product with the numbers given by one image, and then repeating the experiment, and repeating the experiment, and repeating the experiment. And this does the quantum average for you. And this is what they did. And in this paper, they put in evidence that indeed the field phi is ordered, and there is this topological order parameter. Uh, the same group has a more recent paper in which, in which they tested the uh, string order parameter for the spin one chain. That was the consequence, the direct consequence of the work of uh, Duncan. Uh, and it was tested essentially in the last uh, three months. So this is very, very nice. Uh, experimental systems that allows to test this type of contest. OK, uh, uh, I, I, I think in the time that remains, uh, OK, there are some related problems, but on which I will not discuss. Uh, there are a couple uh, 1D tubes with a mod potential on each tube, which has a certain competition between um, the field phi and the field theta. 
The field phi, which would like the mod transition, is in competition with the field theta of the Josephson coupling between the tubes. So this produces a double sine Gordon problem, uh, which is very interesting from a point, theoretical point of view. And in the same way, you can do coupled superfluid pancakes, uh, which is, uh, uh, again, the competition between the vortices that would be created inside one pancake and the Josephson coupling between the pancake that would like to stabilize uh, 3D uh, superfluidity. Actually, uh, uh, the, the classical version of this study, which was done in collaboration with Lara Benfato and Claudio Castellani, we were very proud to include in the book uh, that was mentioned before on the 40 years uh, of the BKT uh, transition. Quantum spin chain is also another system in which BKT uh, reigns supreme. Uh, if you use again this type of mapping that were uh, provided by Duncan, because you can see a quantum spin uh, as defined by two angles, the angle theta, which represents the projection of the spin in the xy plane, the angle phi, which is the, the azimuthal, the deviation from the z direction, and of course, because this is a quantum spin, these two variables do not commute. Otherwise, you could determine the position very precisely uh, of the spin. And again, because of this, you get BKT transition in various spin chains and ladders. I won't have time to discuss this, but I have put a reference if you're interested. OK, let me move to the disordered case. Uh, how much time do I have? About 10 minutes, 5 minutes? Should be good. OK, so if I uh, look at the disorder, uh, then uh, what happens if you take dirty interacting 1D bosons? Well, you use the same trick. Uh, you use the, the density representation that uh, I showed you before, except that now V is a random potential. So uh, lo and behold, this will give the same type of term. And if you work out the renormalization uh, of this problem, you will find that it's also defined by vortex operators. And therefore, as a BKT-like transition, except because the disorder is totally uncorrelated in space, the vortices can have long-range interactions, not interactions, but interactions, only in the time direction. So it's not exactly a BKT transition, but it's very, very similar uh, in spirit. And therefore, the universal transition point is shifted from 2 to 3 half in particular. And of course, there are other uh, physical consequences. This led to the discovery of a new phase, which is what's called the Bose glass phase, and the phase diagram of uh, 1D bosons, for example. No interaction, everybody is localized. They fall in the deepest well of the potential. And then there is a reentrant superfluid phase. Uh, so this is the interaction between the bosons. And here, the bosons are collectively localized. These are interacting particles. So this is localization of interacting bosons uh, due to the combination of interaction and disorder. OK. Uh, let me skip this transparency, which discuss the various phases, MOT, uh, and so on. People try to test this. Doing a disorder is difficult, so they try to do biperiodic potentials. Uh, in cold atoms, for example, this known as the Aubry-André model. And it has also a localization transition. We can discuss whether it's the same as true disorder. But if one does, for example, a DMRG calculation, which was done here by Guillaume Roux, uh, you see that actually the phase diagram is very similar to the one of true disorder. And there are good analytical arguments for that that I don't want to discuss. OK. So one can take bosons in bichromatic lattice. So this time you put two lasers to produce two periodic potentials along the tubes. And if you do this, you can test whether there is this prediction of the Bose glass or have anything to do with the reality. For example, you can measure the momentum distribution. It's measured by a technique which is called time of flight, and compare it with a Luttinger liquid or a DMRG calculation. Here is an example. This would be the pristine momentum distribution uh, of a superfluid at zero temperature. The uh, red line is the finite temperature momentum distribution, and the black curve is actually the result of the experiment. So we, we have pretty good agreement uh, with the experiment. Here is the phase diagram that was observed in the group of uh, Giovanni Modugno, 
This is the interaction between the bosons. This is the strength of the disorder or the biperiodic potential. Uh, and you see, uh, and this is the width of the momentum distribution. You see that there is clearly a phase which is coherent here. Uh, which is the superfluid reentrant phase that I was mentioning. And there is a phase which is incoherent here, uh, which should be the disordered phase of bosons. And additional measurements that I don't have the time to discuss here, transport and so on, uh, assert that this phase here is indeed an insulator. So I won't say that this is the proof that the Bose glass is identified in this system, but it's certainly a very strong uh, evidence that there is indeed uh, uh, this uh, reentrant superfluid phase surrounded uh, by Bose glass. Okay, uh, my time is nearly up, so I think it's time to conclude. Uh, the BKT transition, it has, of course, many consequences. This is not a scoop uh, in 2D superfluid, 2D superconductor, but I wanted also to, to show and point out that it has many, many consequences for 1D. Uh, interacting quantum systems, uh, and one sees that very directly by using formalism that then can uh, build uh, uh, to study these systems. Uh, they have provide a fantastic playground for BKT and topological transition. Uh, we have very strong experimental signature uh, of this transition in cold atomic gases that provide, I would say, a host of uh, uh, 1D quantum system realizations. One could test the universal exponent, one could test the string order parameter. Uh, and finally, if one goes to quantum interacting particles, uh, one could test for this uh, uh, Bose glass phase, this BKT like transition uh, in cold atomic systems. Now, there are, of course, many, many uh, open problems. Uh, the competition between the vortices and the Josephson coupling, so the dual sine Gordon model, is still really uh, not uh, well understood. Uh, even if we understand certain aspects of disorder uh, on 1D quantum problems, there is a lot more to do, uh, in particular if the system is not in contact with the bath. I, I won't have time to discuss this, but I'm sure there will be other talks uh, on uh, this uh, type of topics. Uh, Two-dimensional problem is still, even if they are classical, is still a largely open, uh, open question, for example, uh, uh, 2D on uh, uh, superfluids. And uh, finally, everything that I told you was about equilibrium. But of course, especially in the cold atom systems, one can do out of equilibrium physics. And uh, studying this system in a quenched uh, manner is a, a full uh, an open problem. So on that, I will stop, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Anyone want to ask the first question? Yeah, there is. Is there a stiffness in the Bose glass phase? Sorry? The, does the Bose glass phase have a stiffness? Superfluid stiffness? No, it's zero. It's zero. So it's finite in the superfluid phase and it's zero in the, in the uh, Bose glass phase. So stiffness being defined by the twist in boundary condition. So does the... Response to a twist in boundary does condition. Does the... Um, what's the compressibility of this phase? So the system is compressible. The Bose glass is compressible. Uh, if I go back, uh, maybe it's not a good idea, but if I go back a little bit. So here are the three phases. Uh, the MOT insulator is incompressible and has no superfluid order, but the Bose glass has no superfluid order, but is compressible. But you can define an Edwards Anderson order parameter? You can define an Edwards Anderson order parameter. Actually, in this reference, we use a replica method so we can define uh, the standard Edwards Anderson order parameter. Is there a breakdown of self averaging? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, there is a breakdown of replica symmetry. Whether there is a breakdown of self-averaging, I think, depends on which quantity you want to look at. Even for non-interacting fermions, uh, quantity like conductivity is not self-averaging. So it really depends on which quantity you're looking at. But we can discuss this more. Okay, next question. Uh, here you are considering on-site disorder. Yes. What about if you want to include uh, hopping disorder? So uh, hopping disorder and on-site disorder, 
give essentially the same effect. And you can show it by the same techniques that I showed, except if you're at the magic filling where there is particle hole symmetry. So if you're exactly, for example, in a fermionic system with one fermion per site, then random hopping still produce a relevant perturbation, but the fixed point is different. You go to these random singlet phases, uh, while if you add random on-site disorder, you don't have these phases. Uh, but if you're at the generic filling or lack particle hole symmetry, then they produce essentially the same effect. Thank you. <laughs> Last question. Do you see any evidence for a Mott glass? Uh, not in these systems. It was not tested. Uh, we have some analytic calculation on the Mott glass. But these systems, which are in a, in a parabolic confinement potential, they have a hard time working at a fixed density. So I don't think it's easy to test for that in these systems. Now they are able to do boxes. So I hope that the answer to this will come in a, in a not too distant future. But for the moment, there is no experimental evidence, to the best of my knowledge, of a mod class. But we should discuss also what you call a mod class, because it depends on the authors. OK, uh, so shall we thank the speaker again? Thank you.